Hello, everyone, and welcome to this WealthManagement.com Fast Chat. I'm David Armstrong, the editor of WealthManagement.com. And today I'm speaking with Peter Higgins, the host head of fixed income investing and the senior portfolio manager at Shelton Capital Management. Peter, thanks for joining us again. Uh, thanks for having me back, David. Pleasure to be here. So a lot's happened since the last time we spoke, I think uh, back in March, uh, middle of March, uh, including we had a uh, 25 basis point increase from the uh, Fed. Uh, you want to just give us a quick summary of your thoughts on what's happened recently since the past couple months? Sure. It, you know, it, it's kind of timely when we have our conversations. I think the last one was literally at the, in between the early days of, uh, of the regional banking crisis, uh, but before that March FOMC rate decision. Uh, and if you look at returns since then, you'd think it, nothing happened. You know, the ag, which is a good benchmark proxy for the 16th market, is up over a half a percent. You've got high yield bonds that are up over two uh, percent, and the Nasdaq's even up ten percent since the last time we we spoke. Uh, but it hasn't exactly been a straight line. It hasn't been smooth sailing. There's been a lot of volatility, and really pockets of uh, air pockets, effectively. Uh, at a sectorial level or across different asset classes themselves. But you're right. At, at the, at the time we spoke, you know, we did suggest that there would be another 25 basis point hike that did indeed come. Uh, we also spoke a little bit, uh, uh, I guess foreshadowing the events to come. And we said that wasn't our real belief that the banking crisis would be systemic. And that's important. However, we did see. Silicon Valley Bank go down, led to Signature Bank, went even across the pond to my old firm, Credit Suisse, that was to come to UBS. And then it came back to the West Coast with First Republic and Pac West, and things are still percolating out there. Uh, I guess the, you know, the, the point that I'd make on the banking crisis right now is that we feel confident at Shelton that regulators have reduced that risk of being systemic. Uh, they will act. They will provide liquidity if and when the time is necessary. Uh, but what hasn't changed since we last spoke is uncertainty. There's a lot of it out there. Yeah, that was uh, going to be my next question. We did end that uh, last conversation on the, the note of uncertainty. And uh, it sounds like you have more clarity now or no more clarity now. There's some trend lines coming. Uh, definitely not full clarity, but the trend lines are are as follows. You've got employment starting to slowly roll over. Uh, and we've had a couple of data points since uh, our last conversation. We've had a few more data points on inflation, which is trending downward, albeit probably a touch too high for the Fed's liking. And you've got a consensus building in the marketplace um, that the Fed will pause at its next June meeting. This morning, that probability was about 75% market participation participants expected it to pause. Uh, however, last week, it was about 90%. So there's still some in the, the decision out there, uh, but we'll see what June brings. Uh, yeah. I guess the, the but, point is, though, it certainly still exists. And since we last spoke, there's been a couple new events that have added to further uncertainty. Okay. Well, you want to tell us what those new events are and what's kind of making the uh, outlook a little cloudier for you? Sure. I mean, the obvious one that that is capturing all the headlines today is the debt ceiling. I'm not going to profess to be an expert on this, but it's a known unknown. And if you look at it in the uh, context of history, it causes volatility across all asset classes. So the closer we get to the X date, which Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has declared to be in early June, the more volatile all asset classes will become. And we're already seeing a spike in, in U.S. Treasury bills that mature right around that X date. Uh, the other new event uh, hits the credit markets a little bit more. Uh, it's the release last early last week of the Senior Loan Officer Opinion Survey, which I will call the SLOWS. Uh, this basically is a real good indicator for credit spreads and defaults in our market. Effectively, it, uh, it, it collates the amount of banks tightening their lending standards across the United States in a variety of categories. The net result is that 46% of banks are tightening their credit lending standards. That's up from the last quarter, which was about 44.8, but it's still down significantly from the 
global financial crisis as you would hope to expect, where it was above 80%. So the bottom line is, yeah, banks are still growing. They are lending more credit, but it's contracting. Uh, and once you breach that 50% threshold, you'll be in decline again. But what was interesting was the decline in demand. Uh, this is uh, this uh, recorded the second highest, or I should say lowest print of all time for demand for loans. And I guess that makes sense, right? I mean, if two years ago, you would have wanted to go buy a car and get financing at one, two, three percent. Today, that's seven, eight, nine percent. But you might put that purchase on hold. You might not want the demand for that loan. Uh, and you're seeing that percolate through through the economy right now. So for investors, last time we spoke, uh, you know, you were talking about how bond prices basically are a reflection of both technical and fundamental uh, uh, qualities. You, can you uh, talk a little bit about uh, how you're seeing uh, the uncertainty that you just spoke about uh, impacting those fundamentals and technicals? Uh, you know, give us some maybe some examples of, of you know, how they're impacting the markets today. Yeah, why don't I just carry on with the commentary on the slows? Uh, survey. Basically, tighter lending con conditions mean less credit is accessible for growth. Slower growth could end up in a recession. So from a macro ec fundamental standpoint, you might see the Fed cut rates. And in fact, that's what the market is pricing in, despite the Fed um, still being strong and towing the, the party line of not cutting rates throughout the remainder of 2023. Uh, from a micro standpoint, slower growth makes it more challenging for lower rated credits with greater debt loads to grow into their capital structures. So it has an effect on the, on the fundamental side. Uh, an example of technicals, um, I guess, can be defined simply as the balance between supply and demand. So maybe I'll use the high yield market as a good example. On the supply side, um, New issues or primary bonds priced year to date are up minimally year over year. Um, you have outflows, but those outflows have have uh, more been made more than made up by the coupon payment. So you've got net net cash coming into the market, and then the biggest technical going on in high yield right now is the amount of rising stars. Those high yield rated companies that are now investment grade rated. So what happens in, in our market is, especially those dedicated high yield funds, once those holdings migrate up to investment grade, they sell them, use those cash proceeds, uh, and recirculate that into other high yield bonds, propping up market prices. So we've got this scenario where there's more demand than there is supply, uh, which which is a great example of technicals and probably one of the main reasons why spreads are you know, kind of flirting with historical averages today, despite the economic loom that is around the corner. Another so, example of, um, so. yeah, and this is, I guess, a timely example of technicals is that, you know, the FDIC inherited um, uh, portfolio bonds from the bankrupt regional banks. And they've, uh, on the municipal bond side, they've started selling some of those to the uh, market. Uh, they went well but there's a lot more supply behind that. So you could see a scenario where there's more supply than there is demand, which hurt prices. And I think what we're seeing right now in the muni market is it's sort of in limbo. It's in a holding pattern, waiting for the supply to be met with the right amount of demand before the market makes its final decision of whether to move up or down. So given uh, the economic conditions that you've just laid out and some of those specific examples. How uh, are you changing your portfolio if you are? Uh, how is it impacting how you're uh, allocating money? Um, you know what, we uh, we do make portfolio construction uh, for the short and medium term. And since we last spoke, we haven't changed it too much, but there are some subtle changes and I'll get into them. I guess on the, the macro side, you know, again, if growth is slowing, Mainly, uh, then there could be a recession. If there's a recession, the Fed could cut rates. And when the Fed cuts rates, investors would want a duration. You know, that measures the interest rate sensitivity of a bond. The more, the longer the maturity, the greater that sensitivity is. So we, uh, in our portfolios have gone out a bit in duration to take advantage of this potential pause 
of the Fed hiking and potentially the uh, the end of that hiking cycle. And then on the micro fundamental level, there's going to be more credit dispersion. And we're seeing that in the market where company reports good in earnings, bond prices do well. If it reports bad earnings, bond prices are met with a lot of sellers and those levels go lower and lower and lower. So there's kind of the haves and the have-nots, probably seeing a lot of the similar functions in the, the equity market as well. So from our perspective, nothing's changed, but we do have to be more acutely sensitive to remaining vigilant on the credit underwriting process for the names that we populate our portfolio with. Makes and sense. then I guess on the technical side, you know, I, I mentioned that the, the higher market is shrinking because of all these rising stars. So former double B rated high yield issuers are now investment grade. So uh, the last time we spoke, I think I mentioned that we were straddling the investment grade slash high yield cusp, mainly in lower triple Bs and in higher double Bs. Well, I think the technical backdrop that I, I had already mentioned supports you know those types of holdings, especially in double Bs, where those other fund managers may sell their high yield holdings and repopulate it with new double B holdings uh, supporting prices. So, you know, we've extended duration. We've kept the quality higher in part because of technicals, but mainly because of the fundamentals where we, we do think a recession is uh, on the horizon. Uh, rates will get cut and we'll, and fixed income will be the beneficiary of, of duration in the portfolio. That's interesting because we hear from uh, some financial advisors, you know, they're uh, uh, thinking about uh, further fixed income positions, uh, you know, using U.S. treasuries as an alternative uh, to yeah. the broader fixed income market. It seems to make sense with interest rates higher. What recommendations would you have for those advisors who see uh, treasuries as an alternative to fixed income products? Uh, the- yeah, you're you're very astute. We're hearing the same thing from our clients, uh, in, in fact, quite often. Um what I would say about T-bills, they're short-term instruments. Your return is the interest income generated. But if you buy a longer dated bond, you know whether it's a treasury bond or a corporate bond, you, uh, your total return is going to be captured not just by the interest income, but by any potential capital price appreciation. So if you run a a scenario, and, and I've done this mentally because uh, we've been at so so often. If you take a one year time horizon and buy a six month treasure bill today at roughly 5.11%, and then the yield curve drops 25 basis points, and you buy another six month treasury bill in six months' time, then your all in return is about 4.8%. But if you were to buy uh, a generic double B high yield bond, uh, I'll use Warner Music Group as an example because many of your listeners may have heard of that company. It's uh, rated double B. It's a 3% bond due in 2031, trades at a steep discount. But if you put the same amount of capital to work by buying that bond and holding it for a year, one year and seeing the interest rate curve drop 25 basis points, the power d- duration is going to impact your returns to the point where you're you make 7.6%. So you're almost 300 basis points better than owning those T-bills because keep in mind, T-bill might look attractive today, but if that interest rate curve changes and you want to buy more T-bills, you're getting a lower coupon tomorrow. Uh, it's a great example of you know fixed income. When when interest rates and, and yields go down, prices go up. And you know our belief is that you will see the Fed cut uh, if and when this recession occurs and those asset classes with duration will be the beneficiary of total return. Makes sense. So don't, don't chase the shiny object. Uh, Peter Higgins, this has been great. Thanks very much for joining us. Uh, Peter Higgins, head of fixed income portfolio manager at Shelton Capital Management. And this has been a wealthmanagement.com fast chat. Thanks for listening. Appreciate it, David. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.